odd facts about Princess Louise, the rebel daughter of Queen Victoria. Born on the eve of Europe's first wave of revolutions, Queen Victoria recognised that her daughter, Princess Louise, was certain to be distinct. And distinct she was. Princess Louise was an intelligent child who ripened into a provocative, secretive revolutionary. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Strap yourself in and join me learning about the Queen's most rebellious daughter. Her mother knew she would be special. Princess Louise was born and presented to the world on the 18th of March 1848. The year she was born in was one of troublemaking and rebellion and in 1848 the Europe's age of revolutions occurred and it seemed that the year's rebelliousness would rub off on the little princess Louise. When Queen Victoria gave birth to her daughter, she envisioned that Louise would be something peculiar, and she was right. Her birth was scandalous because after the Queen endured five painful labours, Queen Victoria reasonably wanted some pain relief. She ignored her royal advisers and she insisted on trying the new, controversial treatment called chloroform. The Queen said it made labour delightful and the birth was scandalous because the Queen was basically high during the birth, which was against all conventions at the time. Louise was a curious cat and the royal family believed in the old philosophy that children should be seen and not heard. But Louise was not going to go along with this. She was born rebellious, and from an early age she was a firecracker who was almost too curious for the royal family's tastes. Louise asked so many questions that the family nicknamed her Little Miss Y. As we'll see, the princess's desire to rebel only nurtured greater as she matured. However, Louise was not accustomed to grief and she struggled to handle it. When Louise was just 13 years old, her beloved father, Prince Albert, tragically passed away in 1861. Even though Louise and Victoria didn't have the calmest relationship, Louise was her father's favourite child and the death of her father was extremely hard for Princess Louise. With her mum so engulfed in her own grief, she did not have anyone around her to help her through her grief, and she felt so alone. Queen Victoria was so beside herself with her own grief that she could hardly keep herself composed, and in many parts of her life, she was not composed or present. She struggled to support her children through their father's passing and she basically lost both of her parents in one swoop. And so Louise became withdrawn and stubborn, but even with the probabilities weighted against her, she was a fighter. It took nearly four years after Prince Albert's passing for Louise to finally rejoin public life. Unfortunately, her mother had other ideas for her. Grand balls were a huge part of Victorian culture. The elite young women entered society with an extravagant party called a coming out ball. Louise was a 17 year old princess who was justifiably thrilled about the party. But she was disappointed when her mother canceled the whole occasion. The Queen had decided that mourning protocols for Prince Albert was more important even though it had been years since his passing. This kept the family in a state of grief, unable to move on. Louise was furious. She stomped around the palace in place of the dancing that she should have been doing instead. But she'd make her own fun soon enough. Louise would go on to work with her mother, despite the pair not having the calmest of relationships. Louise could wind her mother up incessantly, 
and she knew just the buttons to press. But her mother was hell-bent on following tradition anyway, and so this meant promoting her troublemaker daughter, Louise, to serve as her personal secretary. Louise was surprisingly good at the work, but she found it boring, and that was until she met a certain gentleman of whom she would have been forbidden from having an affair with. While Louise worked as her mother's secretary, scandalous rumours were spreading throughout England. The rumour suggested that Princess Louise was having a scandalous affair with her younger brother's tutor, the commoner Robinson Duckworth, and that she was falling in love with him. As well as the royal tutor, he was also a reverend, and he was 14 years older than young Princess Louise. When her mother found out, she intervened. Queen Victoria was no fool. Victoria could see what was happening between the pair. It did not take a lengthy time for her to dismiss the celebrated tutor from the royal palace. Victoria believed she had squashed the scandals and rumours with her action, but Louisa's love life would throw many more scandals at the Queen. Her mother took caution. Queen Victoria began to grow wary of her teenage, rebellious daughter, and it didn't take long for their relationship to sour. The Queen frequently disapproved Louise's non-compliance, called her indiscreet and said that she was an imprudent child who got pleasure from arguing. It appeared like no topic was safe in the royal residences because Louise merely refused to hold her tongue. Thankfully, a change of scenery would give the royal family some relief when Louise broke the mould when she became the first princess to attend a public institution. As all of the siblings endured, the children were used to their father's strict and rigid tutoring system. This perhaps encouraged Louise to seek out the education she wanted for herself and blossom into the person she was meant to be. Louise refused to be stuck and trapped within the royal palaces and living by the Queen's endless rules and protocol. And so she decided to venture into the world where she would make a scandalous impression. She became a famed artist. She had learned her skills during her enrolment at the National Art Training School, where she left England dumbfounded by becoming a sculptor. Becoming an artist was a man's role. It was scandalous for a woman to become an artist. Again, Louise followed her own dreams against all society rules. She rebelled and caused controversy by being a royal princess entering the male-dominated world of sculpting. It would have been expected of her to follow more traditionally feminine art forms, such as painting or singing. But even Louise's unconventional career choices didn't compete against her scandalous and dramatic personal life. She was a busy woman. Louise connected with numerous men during her lifetime, and the gossip on no occasion seemed to stop. Some sources claim that she had affairs with one of the Queen's later personal secretaries, along with the famed architect Edward Lutons. Louise was passionately liberal woman, although she preferred to keep her affairs a secret, perhaps to shield herself from her mother's wrath. The royal family were far more concerned with concealing even greater things than affairs. She was beautiful and it was not hard to see why so many men were falling over themselves to be with her. The princess was absolutely gorgeous. She had pale skin, dark hair and a slender figure. Unlike some of her other sisters, Louise was the Victorian era's idea of a jaw-dropping beauty. To this day, she is often called Queen Victoria's most striking daughter. She kept another huge secret. Louise was a handful for Queen Victoria. She was often having to intervene in covering up her daughter's explosive personal life 
in order to protect the royal family. It is alleged that the royal princess didn't just have an affair with Leopold's tutor Duckworth, but that she also had an affair with another of her brother's teachers as well. This time the man was Walter Sterling, and his relationship with Louise would send the royal family into a state of panic. The scandal was pushed far down into the deep realms of other royal secrets, but a scandal that has been resurfaced is one that would have caused great shame at the time. It is rumoured that Louise had given birth at the young age of 18, out of wedlock, and this would have brought endless shame and scandal to the royal family. It was Queen Victoria's doctor, Sir Charles Lowcock, that had started the rumour he had helped deliver all nine babies that Victoria birthed, and it was Charles Lowcock's son, Frederick, who adopted baby boy called Henry in 1867, which was a strange thing for a single man to do, and Lowcock seemingly started getting a fairly sizeable allowance. He had also been given a grace and favour apartment in St James's Palace, when Henry was old enough and had his own children, he started to share the news that Princess Louise was his mother, and this story passed down throughout the next generations. The descendants of Henry Lowcock applied for permission to test the DNA from Henry's coffin to compare against Louise's niece, for the Tsar Alexander of Russia, but unfortunately it was refused by the court of archers meaning the truth was never fully known. In between all of her personal affairs, Princess Louise was still able to dedicate herself to philanthropy. Even as a young woman, she felt passionately that she shouldn't just serve the royal family, but that she should work for the British people. She used her influence as her mother's secretary when she helped open a hospital for children and became the face of royal philanthropy. Louise was able to enjoy her twenties, but time was ticking and the expectation of marriage was, was being forced on her with greater pressure. One thing she did not want was to marry royalty. The Queen set about finding her daughter a husband, as she did for all of her children and many of her grandchildren. Her sisters had all married royalty, and the Queen proposed many princes from across Europe to Louise but Louise was hell-bent on never marrying a man who was a member of any royal family. She already had to struggle with her own stuffy royal family. She did not want to cope with another. Louise knew what she wanted, and she wouldn't concede defeat. Her family was busy showcasing her across Europe, and Louise grew keen on a regular man named John Campbell. He was not a royal, but he was a noble. To the royal family, you were a prince or you were nothing, and despite him being a good pick, the royal family strongly rejected the scandalous marriage. Eventually, Queen Victoria saw sense and conceded. She even stood up for her daughter against those in the family who disputed the marriage. In 1871, Louise and Campbell walked down the aisle with the Queen's approval. However, the Queen did snub the nobleman, refusing him a kiss on the royal cheek, instead insisting he kiss her hand instead. Louise could not escape the rumours and scandals and her wedding was another event that caused a stir. She had not married a royal, and so this would go down in history for centuries. The affair caused so much curiosity from the public and so many people showed up to the ceremony that the authorities implemented for the first time in Britain chain link barriers to protect the couple from the massive crowds. Louise had style, she was an artist and she knew her own fashion and what suited her. She decided to dress herself, even designing her own wedding veil. Sadly the marriage did not end happily ever after. Once married, Louise went straight back to her charity work she helped create the Influential Ladies Work Supply in 1871, a foundation that designed, created and sold embroidery to help those in poverty. 
The organization selected Louise as their president and she also worked as one of their designers. Louise travelled far and wide, even set in foot in Canada as the first British royal where she helped promote the founding of the National Gallery of Canada and the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts. The people of Canada loved her and they even named the province of Alberta and beautiful Lake Louise after her. While away in Canada, she was given the news that her favourite sibling, her sister, the beautiful Princess Alice, alongside two of Alice's daughter, had all died of diphtheria. What was also devastating was she died on the anniversary of Louise's father's death. However, her time here was not without drama when she was lucky to survive. In 1880, she was involved in a shocking experience when she got into a dangerous sleigh accident. Louise was dragged through the snow for 400 metres when the carriage overturned. Luckily, she only had a concussion, but she also had her earlobe torn into two. She was a tough woman, but this started the beginning of a period of delicate health for Louise. Her delicate health was not helped because she liked to follow fad diets, some of them very strange. The princess was continuously excited about exercise and she worked hard to uphold her slim body. It was noted, however, that at a dinner party all she ate was just four Brussels sprouts. Her obsession with her weight was allegedly so that she did not end up just like her mother, Queen Victoria. There was a reason that the Canadian people loved Louise. She had a good heart and this was evident when she used her wealth and influence to create a medical fund and hired a doctor to provide medical attention to the men fighting on both sides of the North West Rebellion. No matter their race, creed or colour, to her, these were human beings that, regardless of their beliefs, needed help. Her good deeds were not without praise from her siblings, who were jealous of her rebellious behaviour. Perhaps jealous that they were trapped under their mother's strict protocols. When Louise returned to England, her homecoming was anything but rosy. One of the members of her family that she got on well with was her sister Beatrice's husband, Prince Henry of Battenberg, who she potentially got on a bit too well with. During a period when scandals were society's form of entertainment, her relationship with Henry did not go unnoticed, and people began to suspect that she was having a twisted affair. Although Louise didn't care what people thought of her, and she didn't care much for appearances either, she was able to ignore the rumours and the true information on this affair will never truly be known. But when Henry passed in 1896, Louise remarked that he was almost the greatest friend I had. I too miss him more than I can say. Because of the rumours that Louise was secretly romancing her own sister's husband, it's not hard to believe that Princess Beatrice would get angry and lash out. Louise alleged that her sister got her own revenge by spreading a dark rumour that she was romantically involved with the Queen's private secretary, Arthur Big. Louise struck back by spreading a rumour of her own. She said that Beatrice made the whole thing up because she was jealous, and then Louise poured salt in the wound. After Princess Beatrice's handsome husband, Prince Henry, passed away, Louise threw the ultimate insult when she claimed that she and Henry were much closer than Henry and Beatrice. She even went so far as to say that Beatrice meant absolutely nothing to her husband. The affair rumours were fuelled further by her ever-dwindling marriage to her own husband upon their return to England. It was not a secret that Louise preferred the company of other men, and the pair lived very individual lives, staying away from each other for long periods. But why was she having such problems with her husband? It is alleged that her husband had a dangerous secret. 
Rumours and scandal were spreading that her husband was in fact gay. Louise was fairly open-minded as the rebel of the family and she didn't seem to care much for her husband's sexuality as the marriage was mostly built for convenience and she was able to keep company with other men so it didn't really impact her. Despite her open-mindedness there was one aspect of his sexuality that she was bothered about and this was his night prowling. One of the ways she tried to stop him was by closing off the windows to their apartment. Louise was keeping her own secret as she was living a life for the feminist movement as a suffragette. This is something her mother was absolutely against. She did not believe in any of their ideas, but Louise was unfazed that her mother disagreed and she did it anyway, showing off her rebellious side once again. Victoria did support her daughter with her artwork, however, which was not the most conventional of careers for women. She openly disobeyed the Queen when she became a vocal supporter for the suffragette movement. She even made friends with Elizabeth Garrett, the first British woman to publicly practice medicine. Part of her passion was to ensure that women were cared for, and one of the things she did was to randomly drop in on factories where women were working and to ensure that the owners and co-workers were treating them properly. She used her wealth yet again to help the ordinary people. She was passionate about helping widows and she would offer to pay so that they could have proper burials for their husbands. While her private life with her husband was dwindling further and further, she began to spend time with a scandalous man. Her husband was always away giving in to his own desires which left time for her to explore her desires. While living in Canada, she had a love affair with an indigenous man that was modelling for her art. This caused huge scandal and rumours began to circle once more. Her mother was set to celebrate 50 years of ruling and a sculpture was being commissioned for the event. Rather than her mother give her the job, she didn't give her child a free pass. Instead, she made her submit her work anonymously and the best piece would be chosen. When it was revealed that the piece had been made by Louise, the people doubted that it was her. Instead, they believed the piece had been made by her male teacher and lover, Joseph Edgar Boehm. Louise was a dedicated wife despite very different lifestyles. They grew old together and remained married until the very end. As the years went by, their bond was nurtured and their friendship grew tighter. During the last years of their marriage, their relationship really flourished. However, John Campbell became unwell, and in 1911 he became so senile that Louise had to nurse him. Louise had lost many family members by this stage of her life, and as she became older, she also became increasingly unwell. Her husband's passing led to a new level of loneliness alongside her grief. It led to a breakdown. She wrote to a friend, My loneliness without the Duke is quite terrible. I wonder what he does now. Luckily, she was able to save the relationship with her younger sister Beatrice, who she had fought with over the years. Queen Victoria gave them neighbouring houses when she passed away perhaps as a plot to force the sisters back together to rekindle their relationship, and it worked. When the sisters became weak and unwell towards the end of their lives, they lived in Kensington Palace in neighbouring rooms. Louise did live until her 90s, which was a mean feat, and perhaps her obsession with exercise and healthy foods contributed to this. She once proclaimed that she would outlive everyone who had made fun of her fitness regime. And Louise did well and almost was able to stick to her word when she passed at the very old age of 91 years old on the 3rd of December 1939. She remained a rebel even after her death and one of her addictions was to cigarettes and she owed a local shopkeeper 15 shillings which is around $300 today. 
She kept this addiction to herself right into adulthood, as her mother would have chastised her for it. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them.